Prince of Wales is at the centre of a political row for apparently denouncing the last government's policy on landmines. But a statement just released from Kensington Palace says the princess made no such criticism. Ulster Unionists have criticised a new British-Irish plan to control terrorist weapons. And two Boeing 757 airliners nearly collided over Kent last November when an air traffic controller told the wrong pilot to descend. That's all this Wednesday lunchtime. From the One O'Clock News, goodbye. Hello there. Well, further change to come over the second half of this week. This bank of clouds swirling around down towards Iberia has brought this morning's rainfall. That's pushing its way northeastward out to the west across the Atlantic. We see this weather system come in. That's probably going to bring rainfall through in exposed regions. The winds with us as we go through this evening and into the night, particularly into the north and west. The low pressure anchored there to the northwest of uh, Northern Ireland, pushing showery rain into the western fringes and also think for Wales, the southwest and along the southernmost counties of England up the channel there we're going to see more showers. Some of those probably turning a little bit heavy, maybe thundery by the end of the night. Further northwards it's clear with dry with some patchy mist. So we start reasonably bright on Thursday morning across much of Scotland into northeastern regions of England. A lot of showers there are probably in the southwest, soon pepping up, becoming more widespread, extending their way northwards and eastwards through the rest of the day. Tomorrow's temperatures are very similar to those of today's. The winds, as you can see, quite windy in the northwest and also into the southwest. Now on Friday we start reasonably fine and dry for many northeastern regions, but with the showers again in the west and the southern coastal fringes. And as Thursday, I think those will become more widespread as we go through into the afternoon. Saturday sees another change coming in, the air of low pressure pushing in from the southwest. We start the day not too bad, certainly in the east. The cloud thickens up, the rain comes in from the southwest, moving across most parts of England and Wales. That's it from me. Have a good afternoon. On Crime Watch UK, help make sense of the tragic killing of 12-year-old Katerina Corneva. Her father chased her murderer, but he escaped. Where did he go? And was he the man seen following another young girl just 30 minutes earlier? And the armed robber who ran amok at the opening of a discount store. Staff and shoppers tried to stop him. He fled with an accomplice. Weave the clues. Your call can make a difference. That's Crime Watch UK, BBC One, this Tuesday at 10. This is BBC One in the South East. The father who tried in vain to save his daughter and her friend. I walked into the bedroom and I thought the pair of them, Claire and Dan, playing dead lines. And a bridge too far, but could this be the last jump for the veterans of Arnhem? Good afternoon. The father of one of the children found hanged in a bedroom has been describing his desperate attempt to save them. 13-year-old Claire Rogers and her 10-year-old friend Daniel Gibbs from Hertfordshire died when a game they were playing went tragically wrong. It was Claire's father who discovered the two children after he went upstairs to get his daughter ready for a shopping trip. Despite desperate attempts to resuscitate them, Daniel and Claire didn't survive the accident. I screamed to my wife. And Sarah, because Sarah was here. Sarah came running upstairs. She then ran back downstairs and grabbed a carving knife and we cut them off the bed. In that time, they did run the ambulance and they were given Sarah instructions over the phone how to do CPR. The two children, who both went to local schools, were good friends and often played together. Today, friends and neighbours have been dropping by the house to pay their respects. The acting headmaster at Daniel's school, Little Green Junior, has said he's a smashing lad who'll be sorely missed. His and all the teachers' thoughts are with both the families. Talia Robeson, Newsroom South East, Cropsley Green, near Watford. Police in Oxford have begun a murder inquiry after a fire killed a nine-year-old girl. Annam Khan died in her bedroom in the blaze at Magdalen Street in Cowley. Her 13-year-old brother, Majid, is still fighting for his life in hospital. Police say the blaze was started deliberately. A South East school's being criticised for letting bullies go unpunished. The school says its controversial no-blame tactics are proving a success, but a children's charity says the approach doesn't tackle the causes of bullying. 
When 13-year-old Vicky suffered repeated name-calling, teachers at Carterton Community College called together a group of pupils who included the bullies. No punishment. Instead, it was up to them to sort it out. OK, so what are you going to do then, personally, Stephen? Make well, it you. Make it an I sentence. Yeah. Not judge Vicky by what other people have said. Um, judge her by what I think. Not right, what other so people. you're not going to judge Vicky by other people's no. standards? But the children's charity Kidscape warns the system could make bullying worse. I think the no-blame system can work very well when the bullying is very low level. However, when there's a nasty, sustained campaign of bullying against a child, I think it can be counterproductive. In fact, it can even lead to more drastic bullying. Carterton Community College says violence is always punished by suspension, but that the no-blame system has been 100% successful in a three-month trial. Anthony Dorr, News from South East in Oxfordshire. And you can see more about the problem of bullying on BBC Two's special series all this week. Now, when the Millennium Exhibition finally opens in Greenwich, it's predicted that visitors could number more than 12 million. But how will they get there? And more importantly, where will they all park? At Falconwood in South London, it's a problem that's already causing alarm and anger because of plans to turn a local green space into a giant car park. James Cameron explains. This is the old A2, Rochester Way in Eltham. Ten years ago, they built a relief road to the south of here to take traffic away from what was one of London's busiest roads. Now, the residents living alongside here fear that the millennium will bring all that traffic flooding back. All we're trying to do is put a stop to it, so we're just collecting names. They've already started a petition and have collected more than 100 signatures since Monday. The site of the proposed 1,400 space car park is here at Falconwood Field. At the moment, there's no direct access onto the relief road, and residents fear it'll mean up to 400 coaches driving past their doors every day on their way to the Millennium Dome. It's getting ridiculous. Taking the children to school, it's horrendous back in the mornings at 9 o'clock, that with the extra traffic of the buses, it's... I, I just hate to think what it's, what it's going to be like. The organisers of the Millennium Experience point out that the extra traffic will only last for the duration of the exhibition, which could be up to two years. They stress the car park will only open during off-peak hours to minimise congestion. Well, behind me you can see Falconwood Field, the site of the proposed car park, and I'm joined by Councillor Alec Miles, who's the leader of the Conservative Group on Greenwich Council and an opponent of the scheme. It looks a pretty good place for a car park to me. What's the problem? you can't get the cars off this car park onto the motorway to the Millennium without going through residential areas. Isn't this a classic case of nimbyism, though? Uh, no, not really. We campaigned for many, many years uh, for the A2 to have a relief road through Eltham. We got the relief road ten years ago. Now they're, going to suge they're suggesting that 400 buses and coaches a day can go back onto the old A2. It's just not fair on the residents who thought that they'd got rid of traffic from their doorstep in the first place. Now, the exhibition organisers are quite proud of the way they say they've organised the transport system to avoid congesting Greenwich Town Centre and surrounding areas. Do you feel they've got it wrong? Yes. Yes, some bright spark thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a park and ride or sail and ride? It won't work in this area. Councillor Miles, thanks very much indeed for joining us. You're welcome. With that, it's back to you in the studio. And finally, 53 years ago, they parachuted into Holland to try and capture one of the bridges at Arnhem. Now they're back in training for what could be their final jump. Jackie Bartley reports. One o'clock and an army began to drop from the skies. Operation Market Garden began on September the 17th, 1944. Sixteen battalions from the 1st Airborne Division were dropped from the skies above Arnhem with the mission to capture one of four bridges over the Rhine. Although a courageous attempt, thousands died. 77-year-old Eric Hall from Forest Hill has taken part in the reenactments of the drop for three years, but today he lives at the Star and Garter home for ex-servicemen in Richmond following a stroke last December. His name has been added to the growing list of vets unable to jump. Oh, ah! The remaining 25 old soldiers aged 72 to 84 have had to get fit and complete three training jumps from 3,000 feet. We've got the chap with one leg, of course, and a blind chap, as usual, brave, very brave, bravest of all of us, I think. Um, well, some people have got arthritic joints and hip joints and all the rest of it, but, you know, they're managing. But the butterflies are always there, you know, just before you go in. But once you're out, it's too late to do anything about it. <laughs> My wife keeps saying, what are you doing it for? And I, 
I don't know, devil man dot about. The commemorative drop will take place over Arnhem on September the 20th this year. Jackie Barkley, Newsroom South East, Salisbury Plain. Certainly puts us all to shame. Now let's catch up with the weather prospects and Richard Edgar's looking a lot brighter than weather today. <laughs> yes, indeed, Charlie. Thank you very much. We've seen some pretty wet conditions this morning. The radar showing some of the rainfall that's been moving across the southeast. It's been fairly patchy in places, but uh, other areas have seen some heavy bursts. That's going to gradually clear away, I think, as we go through the rest of the day. Some brighter skies coming in from the west, but bringing one or two showers as well. Best temperatures today and tomorrow, probably around 20 or 21. Tonight, I think the threat of the showers across the south into the channel may be thunder in places. Tomorrow, day are bright spells and showers, some of which could become pretty hefty once again. That's the weather. Here's Charlie. Thank you, Richard. In our main programme tonight, behind the scenes at Hackney Council. In the second part of a week-long series, we look at the new chief executive's struggle to reform one of the country's most notorious councils. Find out more at 6.30. For now, though, that's it. We're back just after 3 o'clock on BBC Two with the headlines. Bye-bye. New for September on BBC One, Jimmy McGovern's drama.